Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our workshop for the revised PM 2.5 plan for the 2012 PM 2.5 standard. The meeting is being held in person and telecast between our Fresno, Modesto, and Bakersfield offices and via Zoom. My name is Emily Neeland and I'm the program manager of our air quality planning group here at the district. And I'm joined by John Klassen, director of air quality science and planning, Patrick Houlihan, supervising air quality specialist, Molly Boyette, air quality specialist, and we're also joined by a number of staff on Zoom from the California Air Resources Board, including, including Sylvia Vanderspeck, Kirsten Ho, and Jin Liu, who will be sharing some slides on behalf of CARB. We will do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with public participation in person and via Zoom. Before we begin, here are some important guidelines and general instructions for the meeting. Please silence your other communication devices such as your cell phone. During the meeting, all public participants on Zoom will be placed on mute by the host. Public members will not be able to mute or unmute manually. If you'd like to provide public comment during the comment period of this workshop, please step up to the podium if you're in person to signify that you wish to speak or raise your hand on Zoom. Audio for members of the public will be unmuted once they are recognized to make a public comment. You can also submit comments or questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, which will be addressed after the verbal public comment. And you can also submit your public comments to webcast at valleyair.org. If you're presenting or providing a public comment, please state your name and affiliation and speak slowly to allow for smooth translation. At this time, our translators will share instructions on how to access the translation services. Muy buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a la junta. Esta junta tendrá interpretación simultánea disponible en español. Para poder acceder a la interpretación, si usted está utilizando una computadora, buscará el icono de un mundo que aparece abajo de su pantalla. Después seleccionará español y los invitamos a silenciar el lado original. Si están utilizando un teléfono o un, una tableta, el proceso será diferente. Buscarán los tres puntos en la pantalla que digan more o más en español. Después deslizarán hacia arriba en el menú de opciones hacia donde dice interpretación. Luego seleccionarán español. Una vez más, los invitamos a silenciar el lado original al seleccionar la casilla que aparece. Y cuando han acabado, arriba de la pantalla habrá un toque que diga listo, ya no finalizar. Seleccionenlo para poder escuchar en español. Muchas gracias. At this time, we'll go ahead and begin our presentation. And our first speaker is Molly Boyette. Actually, it's going to be Patrick Houlihan, but thank you. <laughs> uh, Molly will have her chance in a second. So uh, once again, Patrick Houlihan here. Uh, in 2012, EPA established a standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. Although it wasn't finalized until 2013, it was still promulgated as the 2012 standard. The district was initially designated as moderate non-attainment as required by the Clean Air Act. The only designations for particulate matter are moderate and serious. The EPA will not automatically designate an area as serious, even though that area should have been serious from the onset. To comply with the requirements, the district submitted a 2016 plan with the request to be reclassified to serious. The EPA then acted on that and reclassified the district to serious in December of 2021. After being reclassified to serious, as we had other PM standards to address, notably the 1997 and the 2006 standards, we opted to address all three in an integrated plan that was submitted in 2018. EPA proposed to fully approve that plan in December of 2021, but then reversed course and proposed disapproval in October of 2022. In response, CARB withdrew the portion addressing the 2012 standard with district concurrence. The district and CARB will now take EPA's feedback, update the plan as necessary, and submit it as the 2023 PM 2.5 plan for the 2012 standard. And that's still going to be within the original deadline of December 31st, 2023. Also, in addition, the plan may include additional analyses for the 2006 standard to address some recent EPA comments. Meeting federal air quality standards is very challenging due to the unique topography and meteorology of the valley. We have mountains to the east, 
west and south of bottling air pollution. We frequently have inversion layers in the atmosphere that trap air pollution during the winter months. We are a major goods movement corridor. We have high population growth. We have pollution entering from other areas of the state. We have wildfires. And uh, finally, even with all the rainfall, we still have drought implications. As a result, we require substantially greater emissions reductions to, to meet the clean air targets than other regions do. So let's talk about PM 2.5. Uh, first of all, PM 2.5 is incredibly small. A human hair is approximately 50 to 70 microns in width. So that means 20 to 28 PM 2.5 particles can fit within the width of a human hair. Uh, that makes PM 2.5 smaller than pollen, smaller than mold. Particulate matter can either be directly emitted or formed due to chemical reactions of gases in the atmosphere. Uh, being so small, these particles can bypass a human's uh, natural defenses and go deep into the lungs, causing health effects such as asthma, difficulty breathing, chronic bronchitis, and even premature death in people with heart or lung disease. The district's mission is to improve the health and quality of life for all of Valley residents through efficient, effective, and entrepreneurial air quality management strategies. We strive to protect the health of Valley residents through efforts to meet health-based ambient air quality standards based on science and prioritize where possible using health risk reduction strategies. This plan will demonstrate the districts and CARB's ongoing efforts to improve air quality in the Valley through a comprehensive strategy. And through this public process, the district and CARB will work to identify opportunities to quantify health benefits of the plan strategy. So we have a foundation built through decades of strategies that are getting us reductions today and will continue to reduce air pollution. Uh, we will also continue to evaluate and add more measures and strategies to get even further reductions. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that the Valley has already attained the one hour ozone standard, the PM10 standard, and the 1997 24 hour PM2.5 standard. There's been tremendous success in reducing NOx emissions since 1980. That has been accomplished through regulatory actions, CARB adopting mobile source emission controls, and strong incentive programs that have been a combined $5 billion in public private investment. However, uh, this success also highlights the challenges ahead as the Valley has many standards still to attain and the ability to reduce emissions even further becomes more and more difficult. So if we could focus on the maps to the left, this is for PM 2.5 averaged over a 24 hour time period. So you can see through 2003 uh, through 2020, our actual monitored data shows the drastic reductions. And then likewise for the maps on the right, those are for PM 2.5 averaged over a year's time period. And with that, I will now turn the presentation over to Molly Boyette. Thank you, Patrick. This slide shows our progress towards attainment at each air monitoring site in the Valley. The graphs display PM 2.5 concentrations at each site and where those concentrations are in relation to the 97 and 2012 annual standards. The top graph displays the 2022 annual average and the bottom graph displays the design value at each site, which is a three-year average and it's the official metric used to determine attainment of federal standards. As shown in the graph, many areas are attaining the 15 microgram standard, and some are attaining the 12 microgram standard. But as previously stated, there's still progress to be made to get the valley into attainment. This table reflects some of the more recent regulatory actions the district has made under plan commitments. A number of measures have been adopted in the past few years covering many different sources. And the highlighted rows show some of the ongoing rural development the district is working on right now, including conservation management practices and several rules for oil and gas. 
Here we see an example of the significant reductions achieved from our control measures in the valley, specifically from industrial boilers. Over time, as different regulations have been implemented, NOx emissions have been greatly reduced, and we are now seeing about a 98% reduction from this source category compared to uncontrolled emissions. This slide shows the requirements for an attainment plan under the Clean Air Act and what we will be addressing in the upcoming plan. This includes an attainment demonstration, reasonable further progress, quantitative milestones, contingency measures, a precursor demonstration, requirements for major sources, emissions inventory, and provisions for the implementation of best available control measures and most stringent measures, or BACM MSM. The district works closely with the California Air Resources Board through this process to address these requirements and develop a comprehensive strategy to reach attainment. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sylvia at CARB to discuss the analyses that they are currently conducting for this plan. Thank you, Molly. So I just want to um, quickly, we can go ahead and um, go to the next slide. So I just want to quickly talk about you know, soil NOx. I know at the last um, workshop that we have, we received a lot of comments and questions um, regarding the soil NOx inventory. And so I just want to thought we'd address them right now. So first of all, you know, CARB recognizes that um, this category needs to be updated as part of, you know, the anthropogenic inventory. And also, I think what's super important is that any estimates that we make reflect actual conditions in California and specific to the San Joaquin Valley. So CARB plans to establish a subject matter review panel um, to start this process. The goal is that the panel, we would um, get the panel, the contract for the panel um, sometime at the end of 2023, possibly beginning of 2024. And then the panel will review the state of the science on NOx emissions from soil. And if there's any future um, research that needs to be done, we wanna make sure that a, this is a robust public process that goes on with this update. And so while this will not be able to be included in this plan due to the timing, um, CARB does plan on including this emissions update in our future PM standards that will be need to need to be developed for the standard that um, San Joaquin, I mean, uh, EPA is in the process of finalizing right now. Next slide. So I'm quick, gonna quickly pass it to Jin Lu and he's gonna talk about um, the preliminary precursor modeling that we've started. Yes. I'm going to present the preliminary findings from our precursor analysis. This slide shows the sample PM 2.5 composition as the Bakersfield California Avenue site, where the speciation data are measured. The key composition of PM 2.5 include organic carbon or OC, ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, crust material, and EC. For OC, the emission sources include cooking, residential wood combustion, etc. Ammonium sulfate, which is formed by socks from stationary sources, and ammonia from dairy and other sources. Ammonium nitrate is formed by NOx from combustion sources, and ammonia from dairy and other sources. Crust material is mainly driven by wind blow dust. For elemental carbon, or EC, the sample emission source include diesel engines. Salt is a very minor component in San Joaquin Valley. Next, please. This slide shows how air quality modeling and precursor sensitivity analysis are conducted. Key components of air quality model include emissions and boundary conditions, meteorology, and chemistry. The left plot shows some sample emission sources of air pollutants in the valley. Air quality model also describes meteorological processes that transport air pollutants around and out of the valley. The middle picture shows the various processes such as advection, deposition, evaporation, etc. Model also describes chemistry of pollutant formation in the air. 
For example, NOx combined with ammonia to form ammonia nitrate in the air. The red figure shows sample PM2.5 distribution from air quality model output. For precursor sensitivity analysis, we first reduce precursor emission in the Selkin Valley by 30%. Then we compare how PM2.5 prediction from model changes in response to that 30% emission reduction. Next, please. This slide shows a preliminary sensitivity analysis result based on reduction of 30% anthropogenic precursors emission in Samkin Valley. Each of the five figures represents the change of design value at all sites in Samkin Valley due to one of the precursors emission reduction. When change of design value at the site is over 0.2 microgram per cubic meter threshold, the site is marked in red color and the site is in green color if change of design value is less than 0.2 microgram per cubic meter. With 30% primary PM2.5 emission reduction, all the sites are marked in red color, which means the change of design value at all sites are over 0.2 microgram per cubic meter. And the biggest change is at the site Bakersfield plants with 2.63 microgram per cubic meter decrease. With 30% reduction of NOx emission, except the sites Merced M Street and the Tranquility, all the other sites are marked in red color, which means the change of design value at all at the most sites in Samkin Valley are over 0.2 microgram per cubic meter threshold. And the biggest change is at the site Cochrane with 0.58 microgram per cubic meter decrease. For scenario of ammonia, rock, and SOX analysis, all the sites are marked in green colors which means the change of design value at all sites in Samkin Valley are below 0.2 microgram per cubic meter threshold with 30% reduction of ammonia, rock, and SOX emission respectively. In summary, our preliminary analysis shows that direct PM2.5 and NOx are significant precursors for Samkin Valley. This concludes the presentation of precursor modeling. Now I'm handing over to Kirsten. Thanks, Jen. My name is Kirsten Kayabyab, and I'm in the South Coast Air Quality Planning section at CARB, and today I am going over CARB's most stringent measure analysis. But before I delve into that analysis, I want to provide an overview of the shared nature of responsibility for California's state implementation plans. There are three levels of government that share responsibility for controlling the sources of air pollution, US EPA, the California Air Resources Board, and local air districts. US EPA is tasked with setting and enforcing national air quality standards, regulating interstate transportation of pollutants, and approving state implementation plans. EPA also sets standards to control emissions from interstate sources, including trains, planes, and ocean-going vessels. CARB regulates mobile sources of air pollution, including passenger vehicles, medium and heavy duty trucks, buses and off-road equipment. CARB also controls greenhouse gases and emissions from some area sources, including consumer products and soon also space and water heaters. CARB is tasked with developing the state SIP strategy and works together with our district partners to develop and adopt SIPs for all non-attainment areas. Most recently, CARB developed and adopted the 2022 state SIP strategy, which includes an unprecedented variety of new control measures to reduce emissions and support attainment of federal air quality standards. Local air districts such as the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District regulate stationary and local sources of air pollution, including emissions from fireplaces, factories, refineries, and power plants. Districts are also tasked with developing and adopting SIPs for non-attainment areas that fall within their borders. Next slide, please. The level of stringency required for the proposed SIP for the 12 microgram PM 2.5 standard is known as most stringent measures or MSM. This is a level of stringency that exceeds the more commonly referred to levels of stringency, reasonably available control measures known as RACM and best available control measures known as BACM. The analysis I'm discussing today covers CARB measures, specifically mobile sources and residential and commercial space and heating appliances. It looks at control measures currently being implemented by CARB and compares those to the control measures in other jurisdictions, states, and non-attainment areas. 
And it also includes a discussion of potential measures from public measure suggestions gathered through the public process for this SIP and for the 2022 state SIP strategy. It assesses this range of potential measures for stringency and feasibility to ensure that measures meet the MSM requirements that US EPA has set forth. CARB has previously demonstrated and US EPA has approved our mobile source program as MSM. Most recently, this was included in the San Joaquin Valley's 2018 PM 2.5 plan, which US EPA found to meet the requirements of MSM. And as discussed in the previous slide, CARB's analysis complements the district's analysis, which covers stationary sources. Next slide, please. As a preface before we jump into the more detailed discussion of the analysis, I want to discuss CARB's authority under the Clean Air Act to set engine standards that are more stringent than federal requirements. This is a unique position that California enjoys. Other states can either adopt California standards or federal standards, but they cannot set emission standards of their own. This unique authority exists because CARB's regulatory actions to control emissions from motor vehicles predates the existence of the Federal Clean Air Act or US EPA. And over the years, we've continued to adopt increasingly stringent regulatory actions to control emissions from new vehicles, trucks, off-road equipment, and the fuels that power them. Because other states do not enjoy this position, it often means that CARB's de facto level of stringency of control measures is MSM. Next slide, please. So this slide presents an overview of the MSM requirements and EPA has spelled that out as a four-step process. It starts with looking at the emissions inventory to identify the sources of direct PM and precursor emissions. And for the Valley, this means NOx. The second step is to identify the full range of potential control measures, both those being implemented by CARB and those within other states or jurisdictions. And the third step is to evaluate those potential control measures for feasibility and stringency. Step three is also where we evaluate public measure suggestions. And finally, the fourth step is to adopt and implement the control measures identified as feasible and sufficiently stringent as identified in the previous three steps. Next slide, please. So the first step shows a snapshot of the mobile sources from the emissions inventory. For this SIP, 2017 is the base year and 2030 is the maximum out year for attainment. This shows NOx and direct PM 2.5 emissions from the various mobile sectors. And that includes light duty or passenger vehicles, on-road medium and heavy duty vehicles, including trucks and buses, and off-road equipment, as well as those sources that are primarily regulated at the federal and international level. For the San Joaquin Valley, that category is comprised of aircraft and railroad emissions. We are also including space and water heaters within our MSM analysis, but for the purpose of keeping today's presentation relatively brief and focused, I'm focused on providing a snapshot of mobile sources as an illustrative example of the process we are going through for the MSM analysis. We're doing the same process for space and water heaters, even though it's not shown on this slide. Next slide, please. The second step is to identify the range of potential control measures. And we start with identifying CARB's regulations, both the current regulations and those we committed to in the 2022 state SIP strategy. These are compared to control measures in other jurisdictions and states to identify which is the most stringent control measure. For each category of emissions, we analyze controls that fall into a few different categories, emission standards and or engine standards, in-use controls, which includes fleet rules and testing and idling requirements and fuel standards. This slide shows a snapshot of the heavy duty in-use fleet rules, which we selected to illustrate our process for this analysis because it's a significant emission source in the Valley. And it shows a few of CARB's in-use fleet rules, including programs that have been ongoing for many years like truck and bus, as well as the solid waste collection vehicle regulation, as well as newly adopted measures like the advanced clean fleet regulation, which we just adopted last month, and measures that we've committed to in the state SIP strategy, but have not yet taken to our board, like the zero emission trucks measure. For each of these, we found that CARB's suite of control measures are the most stringent measures in the nation. No other state requires that heavy duty fleets use diesel particulate filters or have turned over to model year 2010 or later equivalent engines like we have with truck or bus. No other state has zero emission fleet requirements like we have under the advanced clean fleets regulation, and we will be further developing through the zero emission truck measure. And while we found that New York City has stringent requirements for their solid waste collection vehicles, 
They limit emissions for at least 90% of their fleet to meet EPA's 2007 diesel standard for PM. CARB's program is nonetheless more stringent. We limit our PM emissions to approximately the same level, but because there's overlap between the solid waste collection vehicle regulation and truck and bus, California solid waste collection vehicles with model years 2007 through 2009 have actually been required to upgrade those engines to 2010 engine equivalent standards under truck and bus, whereas those same vehicles would not be required to do so in New York. So we're going through the same level of rigorous analysis for all of the other mobile source categories for passenger vehicles, for on-road heavy duty vehicles, for off-road equipments, and we are analyzing this suite of control measures, including new engine standards, in-use fleet rules, and fuels for each of those sectors. We also analyze in-use fleet rules for some sources that are primarily regulated by US EPA, including locomotive operations and aircraft, and we're going through a similar process for space and water heaters. Next slide, please. Step three has two components. The first is to evaluate the measures for stringency. EPA specifically define, excuse me, defines stringency in terms of implementation timeframe and the stringency of the requirements. Basically, the step is to ensure that each measure could not be either implemented more expeditiously or in a more stringent manner. Due to the nature of CARB's suite of regulations, namely that we're pushing to zero emissions everywhere feasible, it isn't viable to either expedite the time frame for our control measures or to necessitate more stringent requirements. This section discusses why, both from the perspective of economic and technological feasibility. Because so many of CARB's regulations are forcing industry to develop cleaner technologies than what already exists in the current market, which is known as technology forcing regulations, we need to provide lead time for economic feasibility considerations. Regulated parties and manufacturers need time to make the necessary changes to their business strategies, as well as provide sufficient time for fleet rules to be phased in such, as, such that they're economically feasible. This is where equity considerations also come into play. Economic feasibility means different things depending on who the purchasers of those goods are. And there also needs to be sufficient lead time for technological feasibility considerations with technology forcing regulations. This means manufacturers need sufficient time to develop, certify, manufacture, and bring to market the requisite clean technologies to meet CARB's increasingly stringent new requirements for mobile sources. Again, the heavy duty in-use fleet rule shows a nice illustration of the range of feasibility considerations, as well as the timelines that we have for the various measures. Some of them like truck and bus, the solid waste collection vehicle regulation, and the public agency and utility regulation are currently being implemented, while others like the innovative clean transit and advanced clean fleece rule will begin their phased in implementation schedules in the near future. And yet others like the zero emission airport shuttle bus regulation and zero emission trucks measure require more lead time with dates that are further out from implementation because they are pushing the envelope in terms of clean technologies. The same holds true for the light duty and off-road control measures. Next slide, please. This slide covers the second component of step three, which is to evaluate the feasibility of the public measure suggestions. On the heavy duty side, we've received three measure suggestions during the 2022 state SIP strategy public process. They are an on-road heavy-duty vehicle useful life reg regulation, adding additional incentive programs for zero emission trucks, which could entail incentive programs such as supporting local zero emission zones and or differentiated registration fees. And the third suggestion was an indirect source rule, which could take the form of either a direct rule under CARB's authority or a suggested control measure. All of these were incorporated into the zero emission trucks measure in the 2022 state SIP strategy. And as a potential suggested control measure, the indirect source rule may not be approvable as a SIP measure um, because suggested control measures are not SIP enforceable. So CARB staff continues to investigate the feasibility of this public measure suggestion, specifically regarding whether it would meet US EPA's approvability criteria for SIP measures and legal questions around statutory authority, which is designated to CARB and the air districts. Next slide, please. The fourth step is to adopt and implement the feasible control measures that were identified in the previous three steps. 
Most of the measures included in the analysis have already been adopted and are either being implemented currently or will be implemented soon. Some of the measures have yet to be adopted, but because they were in this 2022 state SIP strategy, that included a commitment to propose those measures to the CARB board for their consideration prior to 2030. Next slide, please. This shows the preliminary conclusions we've come to thus far in the process. We found that CARB's control program for each source category analyzed meets MSM requirements. And again, each mobile source category is broken into three main elements, new vehicle and engine standards, the in-use emission controls, and fuel regulations. We also discussed the commitment we made in the 2022 state SIP strategy for the zero emission space and water heater standard, which we find to be the most stringent measure of its kind in any state. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? We continue seeking public comments, including any suggestions for additional control measures under CARB authority. And if you have any, please direct them to the contact information shown here. The email address is sipplanning at arb.ca.gov. We will then incorporate the comments we receive and we will release a draft of the MSM analysis for public review as part of the district's document release. And I will now turn it over to the district for their discussion on their portion of the MSM analysis. Thank you, Kirsten. Similar to CARB, the district is currently evaluating the control measures for sources under district authority to provide for implementation of BACM and MSM. The district is conducting a robust analysis of all PM 2.5 and NOx rules, which will ensure implementation of the maximum degree of emissions reductions achievable considering technological and economic feasibility in the Valley. Notably, EPA has previously approved that the district measures meet MSM, and our preliminary analysis shows that district measures continue to meet MSM. This thorough evaluation includes multiple steps, which we'll go into a little more detail on in the next few slides. The first step is to identify the district's control measures for sources of PM and NOx, for which we have identified 31 rules, and we will cover all of those in the next few slides. Under current evaluation is our rules for open burning, reduction of animal matter, prescribed burning and hazard reduction burning, PM emissions from incineration of combustible refuse, cotton gins, fuel burning equipment, multiple rules for boilers, steam generators, and process heaters, Dryers, dehydrators, and ovens, flares, lime kilns, large boilers, steam generators, and process heaters, and solid fuel-fired boilers, steam generators, and process heaters, glass melting furnaces, conservation management practices, commercial char boiling, internal combustion engines, stationary gas turbines, wood-burning fireplaces and wood-burning heaters, residential water heaters, natural gas-fired fan-type central furnaces, general requirements, construction, demolition, excavation, extraction, and other earth-moving activities, bulk materials, carry-out and track-out, open areas, paved and unpaved roads, unpaved vehicle equipment traffic areas, agricultural sources, and indirect source review. After identifying the rule and source categories, we compare them to state and federal regulations. These regulations include EPA's control techniques guidelines, alternative control techniques, and new source performance standards, as well as California Health and Safety Code requirements and CARB's airborne toxic control measures. Step three includes review of control measures and regulations adopted by agencies in other areas such as the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, South Coast Air Quality Management District, Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District, and Ventura County Air Pollution Control District, as well as many other air agencies and local authorities across the nation. The district carefully compares these rules with a focus on requirements as a whole and consideration of the differences in regional situations. All potential BACM MSM identified through this process is thoroughly evaluated using key factors identified in EPA's implementation rule to determine what may qualify as BACM MSM for the Valley. Key factors include technological and economic feasibility, 
The analysis for technological feasibility determines that the potential opportunity to reduce emissions is viable for existing facilities and operators in the Valley, given operating needs and restrictions. Through this analysis, the district reviews backed guidelines, permits, environmental and technological studies, EPA and CARB guideline documents and rules, regulations and guidelines in other areas. To determine economic feasibility, a cost effectiveness analysis is conducted to evaluate the economic reasonableness of an air pollution control measure or technology as it applies to operators in the Valley. The district examines the added cost of a control technology or technique in dollars per year divided by the emissions reductions achieved in tons per year to determine if a control measure is cost effective. As a final step, the district also considers whether a contingency measure component would be feasible for each control measure. And this specific requirement will be addressed in more detail in future workshops. We also want to note that the district is currently working on a contingency package to address multiple PM standards. Um, a contingency measure must be economically and technologically feasible, feasible for a contingency trigger and beyond what is needed to achieve attainment. We invite public participation and comment as we continue plan development. Our next step will be to finalize the BACM MSM evaluation and discuss those findings at the next workshop. This summer, we plan to publish the initial SIP elements for 30-day public review and comment before the governing board hearing and submittal of the document to EPA. And then plan development will continue throughout the second half of the year with additional workshops before we take the plan to the governing board. And as the district conducts the BACM MSM evaluation, we are especially seeking input on sources of interest, potential emission reduction opportunities, for identification of cutting edge technologies. Throughout the plan development process, if you have any questions or comments, please use my contact information shown on this slide. And if you would like to receive email updates on this process, including announcements of future workshops and hearing dates, sign up for the district's PM plans listserv available at the link on this slide and on our website. This concludes our presentation today, and now we'll take some time for any public comments or questions, um, especially on these key questions we have here on this slide. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, so first we will open up for any public comments here in the central office. Okay, hearing none, I will go ahead and switch to Zoom. First we have Genevieve M. Salem. Genevieve, I am going to, you should be prompted to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Genevieve Amsalem. I'm Research and Policy Director with the Central California Environmental Justice Network, or CCEJN. I had some questions going back to kind of mi middle of your slides about uh, the precursor analysis. I saw in one slide that um, the Bakersfield composition of PM2.5 was something around 20% ammonium nitrate. And um, if I remember correctly, that is the composition of um, particles during the summertime and not necessarily um, annually or um, in the winter when it's worst. And so I was wondering where um, that came from. And I would love to hear more information about the precursor analysis. Was that, um, was the precursor analysis predicated off of this um, speciation data that shows ammonium nitrate being a small component. Um, and, and, and then I have more questions, but I would, I would love to uh, hear more about that. Yeah, this is Jeremy Avis, uh, Chief of the Modeling and Meteorology Branch. I can take a, a crack at that and then uh, Chen Xia, you can chime in if you'd like. Um, and maybe we can, can we go back to that slide? Is that possible? I think it's, yeah, oh, this slide. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is actually, um, I'm trying to remember the, the years, um, I believe this is 2015 through 2019 um, data, and this is annual um, speciated data. So this does represent an annual average um, because we are looking at the annual standard. Um, like you, you mentioned, you know, if we're looking at wintertime, then the ammonium nitrate um, fraction is gonna be a lot greater. 
but on an annual average basis, this is this is what we're looking at. You said that's 2015 to? 2019, I believe. So it's kind of like aggregated and averaged? Correct. Okay, and so was this what was used to then do the precursor analysis? This, um, this feeds into it, but the precursor analysis is based off of modeling. And then we look at um, essentially looking at, so we're, we're modeling um, a base and future year. So a base year of 2017, a future looking at 2030. And then in, in the 2030 timeframe, we look at um, if we reduce emissions um, of NOx, of SOx, of direct PM and all of the precursors by 30%, how does um, the design value change? And that is the composition does feed into that. So yes, uh, the composition composition feeds into that. Okay. But this so is really the start the starting point of that analysis. Okay. So yeah. you used 2017 as a base year and just did a straight up 30% reduction to specific uh, precursors. You didn't also incorporate like expected NOx reductions you you plan to get in the future. This is just using real existing. No, this is this is using um, so the, the starting point of the analysis is 2017, but then um, we're looking out to the future in 2030. So this does include reductions out to 2030, um, sort of expected reductions out to 2030, as well as um, the state SIP strategy, reductions from the state SIP strategy. Okay, so you're you're predicting future emissions. That's part of the model. Correct. Okay. Is it also possible if we're you know we're doing this modeling exercise? Um, the previous slide was talking about soil NOx and soil NOx being a potentially large unaccounted for amount of emissions, um, which could sway uh, kind of our, our equation that we use here. You know, we think that there's a lot more ammonia in the atmosphere than there is NOx and therefore reducing ammonia wouldn't be um, super effective. But is it possible to do an alternate analysis that uh, uses a NOx inventory that has been proposed by other researchers just to give us an idea if our NOx inventory is um, undercounted, um, what those numbers would look like looking into 2030? Right. Um, it's, it is something we're considering doing. Um, right now, it's sort of a balance of, of time and resources. Um, but I do, I, I think in terms of what we see at Bakersfield, at least in the past when we have looked at um, soil NOx, we didn't see huge impacts in the urban regions. Um, there was a bigger impact in, more, in the more rural regions. Um, so I wouldn't expect a huge impact in Bakersfield, um, but it is something that is on our to-do list given you know, timing and sort of resource constraints. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would advocate for that additional modeling so that we can all um, stay up to date on um, the possibilities. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Genevieve. Next up, we have Ian Saluna. Ian, you should be allowed to unmute. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, my, I had a question about um, the the sensitivity analysis you did. Um, you showed that it changed. You, you called out any time the design value changed by 0 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter. And that seems like, I'm just curious what that threshold is about. But I think more importantly, I'm interested in knowing the modeling that was done initially in the base case how did that compare with observations of PM 2.5 throughout the valley? Just to, to get a sense of, is this model capturing, as I think Genevieve was kind of alluding to, capturing all the pertinent sources that are contributing to the PM 2.5 problem, particularly in the winter time, as Genevieve also called out. And I just want to point you to, to a recent study by um, Luo, and Lena Luo and Daniel Cohen from Rice University, where they had adjusted a, a agricultural soil emissions uh, 
scheme, they, the fertilizer emission scenario tool for CMAC, and they find that there are large emissions of um, NOx even in the winter time. So they have something like on average 25 to 30 tons per day of NOx emitted October, November, December. So um, that's just another bit of information out there in terms of the literature that's um, that's estimating that there are large soil sources even in the winter time when the PM problem is is the most exacerbated. I know that was a lot, but I just wanted to ask, how is the model doing in terms of capturing uh, the observed PM two point five in the uh, in the base case? Yeah, we're actually so with the analysis we've done so far actually looks quite quite good in terms of model performance. Um, it is always, you know, the biggest concern always is, is being able to simulate the peak concentrations that we see in the winter time. Yeah. Um, we didn't see any issues with that this time around in terms of, of being able to model those, those peak values. Um, I think we're seeing model performance that's, that's on par or better than what we've seen in the past. Um, but, but certainly, and I think even in the, I have to go back and look at what, what the soil NOx levels were in the winter time, um, but there certainly is some there, but we didn't see any, um, we don't see any big under predictions that, that are cause for concern at this point. Um, the analysis that you're talking about though, just in terms of um, a, a complete sort of model performance analysis is something that's gonna come as we, as we continue moving forward with the plan and, and, um, and write things up. So that will be out there eventually. Okay, thank you. And then, and then, Ian, the the zero point two threshold that you had had mentioned that act, that's actually a definition or defined by EPA in terms of um, for annual PM two point five, what is considered a significant um, precursor. So, if you change the emissions by reduce emissions by thirty percent, if the change in PM two point five is less than 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter on an annual basis, then uh, the precursor that that Precursor emissions are considered not significant. If it's greater than point two, then they're considered significant. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Jeremy. Next up, we have Perry Ellert. Perry, you should be allowed to unmute on Zoom. Hello. Thank you, and good afternoon. I just had a quick question as to uh, the presentation talks about the federal standards under the Clean Air Act. I was wondering if um, you can maybe talk about other federal standards, for example, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act that would apply to the SIP. And I was curious to know if the Air District is planning on analyzing how this plan complies with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and how the district's actions, including permitting actions, um, will not be intentionally uh, discriminatory or potentially have a discriminatory effect based on race, color, or national origin. Um, thanks. Thanks, Perry. This is John Klassen. Just to respond to that, yes, we are evaluating that, and EPA is working on some national guidance on how to address Title VI and attainment plans, so we're looking for that guidance to come out soon, so of course we can follow that closely and then develop that information within this plan that we're working on currently, so that is, that is forthcoming. Thank you. Great, thanks, Perry, and thanks, John. Next up, we have Cynthia Pinto Cabrera. Cynthia, you should be prompted to unmute on Zoom. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Beautiful. Uh, so I was wondering if we could get a little bit more information on uh, the rules that are under the uh, most stringent measures, best available control technology evaluation. Um, I see there's like all of the dates for adopted, last amended. Does this mean is there going to be more opportunities for additional like comments or revisions until you know the end of the year? Just kind of curious about that, uh, especially uh, forty nine oh five for the uh, gas natural gas fired uh, furnaces. So just wondering um, what evaluations you guys are doing for those rules, and is there going to be opportunities for public engagement? Hey Cynthia, this is Emily. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that question. We are currently conducting our MSM and BACM evaluations. And um, I think the, the question on the slide outlines really nicely. We are looking for public input on, on your sources of interest that you would like us to, to take a closer look at. 
or any additional opportunities that you may see that you want to make sure are on our radar. So I would say specifically for building electrification, for 4905 and some of the other building electrification related rules, we're definitely taking a close look at opportunities that other air districts are exploring. And through our evaluation process, we may identify some additional opportunities. And we're also taking into consideration that CARB state SIP strategy currently includes a commitment to, to put together a, a regulation that would start as early as 2030. Um, so those are some of the things we're currently looking at. The evaluation is ongoing. So like I said, we would really appreciate your input. If you have any information that you'd like to provide to us or submit written public comment, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And is uh, are you guys going to host another public workshop when that uh, uh, evaluation is completed? Yes, yeah, we plan to have another public workshop that presents more of our, our findings from the evaluation. And through this whole process and through that workshop and beyond that, you're more than welcome to continue submitting your feedback. Great, thank you. Perfect, thanks, Sylvia. So next up, we have Jed Holtzman. Jed, you should be prompted to mute on, unmute on Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jed Holtzman, representing RMI, <clears throat> excuse me, representing RMI, an independent nonprofit working to accelerate the clean energy transition and improve lives. Um, I, I wanted to point out, I guess, since your stationary source control measure analyses for the 2018 PM 2.5 plan, other air districts have moved ahead of San Joaquin Valley in acting to address the health harming and climate disrupting pollution from fossil fuel appliances using zero emission standards. The Bay Area AQMD has already adopted the amended rules 94 and 96 to establish zero NOx standards for water heaters and furnaces. Meanwhile, the South Coast AQMD has kicked off the rulemaking working group for zero NOx large water heaters and will soon initiate the process for amending other building appliance rules, including zero NOx small water heaters and furnaces. The Air District's finding in 2018 that each of your building appliance rules, quote, currently has in place the most stringent measures feasible to implement in the Valley and therefore meets or exceeds Rackham, Backham, and MSM requirements for this source category, unquote, needs to be reevaluated in light of these other zero emission standards, both present and planned. I did not see that in your presentation today. Instead, I saw that your preliminary analysis was that district measures continue to achieve MSM. Any complete BACM or MSM analysis submitted to EPA in June must investigate all of the work and planning by partner agencies on building appliance emissions. EPA explicitly directed this agency to consider the Bay Area AQMD's appliance rules, which begin to take effect in 2027, years earlier than CARB's proposed timeline for their zero emission appliances rulemaking. Given the very serious air quality and public health consequences to the Valley of delaying reductions of appliance pollution, the Air District should move to align its, its emission reduction policies with the Bay Area AQMD. In addition, the Air District should seriously consider taking even faster action on a subset of the appliance sector to achieve the near-term reductions the region desperately needs. As two examples pertinent to the question up on the slide right now for potential emission reduction opportunities, a mandate for zero emission furnaces and water heaters for new buildings and major rehabilitations is technically and socioeconomically feasible in the immediate term and should be pursued for near-term emissions reductions. Similarly, the Air District may also want to consider a manufacturer sales target starting next year that ramps up over time for zero emission appliances up to 100% by 2030, for example, or another target year as a means of achieving near-term reductions. This region must demonstrate additional emission reductions to achieve the air quality standards required of it. And the EPA's proposal of a more stringent standard for PM 2.5, which I know the, the district has been discussing, only makes even more salient the need for this agency to pursue zero emission appliances on the fastest timeline possible. In addition to doing everything it can to achieve emissions reductions on the compliance timeline required for the current plan, there is absolutely no reason 
for the agency to delay pursuing other necessary and feasible emissions reductions simply because they may accrue or continue to accrue beyond that limited compliance timeline. Lastly, if I could just say, the Bay Area Air District's modeling estimated that the PM 2.5 reductions from their zero emission appliance rule amendments will avert up to 85 premature deaths each and every year in perpetuity, with health benefits from the rule estimated to reach $890 million annually. The Valley Air District deserves these health benefits. The Valley Air District should pursue a similar health impacts analysis to identify the benefits to community health and disproportionate exposure that zero emission appliance rules will bring to the region. Really appreciate the time of staff as well as all of the other parties attending. Thank you. Perfect, thanks, Jed. Um, really appreciate those comments. I know we've had some continued conversations with your group on, on this topic. Um, the regulations from other air districts is something that we're really closely tracking and is going to be a conversation as part of this back of MSM analysis in the plan. And we are looking at opportunities for this source category as well as others as well. So really appreciate those thoughts and we'll continue to, to conduct our analysis. And at the next workshop, we plan to present additional information on our conclusions. So just really appreciate your thoughts and continue coordination with us as, as we may have potential questions and, and just reaching out to you in the future. Thank you. And with that, I do not see any additional public comment on Zoom. I will do a last call. Oh, really quick. It looks like Brent Newell. I will go ahead and prompt you to unmute on your screen. Good afternoon. Um, I'm curious about uh, what the, uh, the attainment demonstration looks like. Hey, Brent, this is John Klassen. Maybe uh, Sylvia, you popped on. Do you want to? give an update on, on when that work will yeah. be done. Yeah, I mean, we haven't um, started the that process right now because of the timing on these. We've been doing the precursor uh, sensitivity. And so the attainment demonstration would still need to include, um, you know, um, possible controls from both CARB and the district, you know, moving forward. So we have not um, started on that yet. Will there be a workshop at which time that data and modeling and attainment demonstration will be made available to the public? Of course, you know, we're going to have workshop. I think as the district mentioned, there's still going to be one more workshop on this subject. And then we will start transitioning to everything that goes along with the attainment demonstration and demonstrating attainment um, of the standard for the San Joaquin Valley. Great. I have another question about the uh, the precursor analysis. the The ammonia precursor precursor analysis showed an impact of uh, zero point one eight micrograms per cubic meter, which is just below the zero point two zero threshold that you've identified, and that's at a thirty percent reduction. Uh, has CARB modeled um, the sensitivity at a higher percentage of ammonia reduction than 30%? Yeah, this is Jeremy again. Um, not yet, but I mean, obviously we would expect it at a higher than 30%. At some point, what that, what that number is, if it's 40% or 50%, um, we don't know uh, at what point that would cross over you know, the 0.2 threshold. That, that seems to be pretty relevant information for the workshop. Yeah, it's something we can continue to look at once we have, um, once we have whatever additional, I think, reductions we're going to be looking at in terms of controls in the future year. Um, but the plan is last time, last time we did the precursor sensitivity um, for the last step, we did look at at a few different threat or a few different ranges in terms of reductions, and so we would plan on doing that again and having that as part of the final um, SIP documentation. Will that be part of the next workshop? Um, it will depend on when the workshop is. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I think Jeremy, this is Sylvia. So I think um, 
you know, we will be as part of part of the precursor demonstration, you know, we will be looking at both 30 and 70%. I mean, right now, this is preliminary information. We thought it was important to share it with the public, you know, as preliminary means we have not finished um, all of the analysis and we will con be continuing to work on that. Um, and including all of the documentation that's associated, um, you know, um, with the rest of it. So it'll be a complete precursor analysis. Um, we will be presenting the next time that we have this workshop on this subject. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Great. Thanks, Brent. Genevieve, it looks like you are next. I have prompted you to unmute. Hi again. Yes, Genevieve Amsalem. I have a question about uh, past programs to reduce emissions. I know we had a pretty big incentive program to change out agricultural tractors, largely funded through the farmer program. I was wondering if there's an update on that and if we've achieved the NOx emission reductions that we expected to achieve at this point. Um, yeah, just interested in, in the in the tonnage or the percent reduction um, there. And and, um, last, and sorry, let me just add uh, regarding the precursor analysis. In addition to um, modeling, um, if you know additional NOx in the atmosphere from soil and model modeling a greater than thirty percent reduction in ammonia, um, also. Um, having like a clean model that doesn't include expected emission reductions because those, um, while we expect them and hope for them, they cannot be um, fully, you know, they can't be final, you know, we can't completely uh, expect them. And so I'd love to see kind of like a clean model that doesn't have these kind of future predictions baked, baked in. But uh, yeah, the question's about uh, agricultural tractors, thank you. Yeah, so this is Sylvia. I'll go ahead and actually answer both of those questions. And as far as, you know, those those emission reductions are happening, we've already committed to those measures that are included in this analysis. When the CARB board adopted the state SIP strategy last September, we committed to um, do all of those measures um, that are committed to um, that we included in this analysis. And so um, they're not measures that are not going to happen. Um, on the ag equipment, um, we're in the process of um, doing our annual report that we post on our website about where we are on that. It's my understanding that um, with the, the current funding that we have for the ag incentive measure, we have met that commitment. Um, and so we will definitely be trying to um, translate that those emission reductions and the reductions from the ag incentive as you know possibly a new um, measure that's not been included in this yet um, if, as part of the attainment demonstration. So we are considering that. Thank you, Sylvia. Great, thank you so much. So with that, I'm not seeing any additional indication of public comment on Zoom. Let me check the webcast at valleyair.org email really quickly. I'm not seeing any additional public comment on our email as well. So with that, we will go ahead and conclude the public workshop and just want to thank you all again for your attendance and for your thoughts here today. We'll definitely be taking them into consideration as we continue to develop our analyses. And again, just thank you for, for your participation.